Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to be covering the second way to add vectors, and that is through Cartesian vector notation. Now notice how it says notation. So this kind of alludes to the idea that we are going to express our vectors in a very specific way. Now in the last video, we talked about the parallelogram method and we said, yeah, we can add vectors using it, but it's basically a pile of crap. No one wants to use that method. It's very inefficient and it's time consuming. So this is going to be an alternative method to add these vectors together. And as you guys are going to see, it's the preferred method because it's nice and simple. So with that being said, let's jump into the video. So Cartesian vector notation, or as a lot of people call it CVN, provides us with an alternative method of analyzing vectors. And more importantly, it specifically addresses the challenges that we had with the parallelogram method. Those challenges being namely the heavy reliance on trigonometry. Remember, no one likes trigonometry. If you tell me you like trigonometry, you're a liar. No one likes trigonometry. The second thing is adding multiple vectors is complex and time consuming. Remember that we said if we have three or more vectors, we can't really do it. We have to go two vectors at a time and slowly work our way up to the number of vectors that we have. That's a pain in the ass. Again, no one wants to do that. Now, the last problem that I have, and I say I because it's not a problem you guys will have yet, but later on it will be. That is, it is hard to program. As you guys are going to see later, everything in engineering can be done very nicely using a computer. If we have a problem where it's basically just trigonometry, it's very hard to program that problem. This Cartesian vector notation method, as we're going to see, is going to be very simple to program and allow us to do a lot of things very quickly. So the Cartesian vector notation is based upon resolving vectors into components on an orthogonal axis system, where orthogonal is basically perpendicular. Now that sounds like a lot of word garbage, but it's actually very nice because an orthogonal axis system is something you guys are already used to. You may not know it yet, but for instance, it's a simple X and Y coordinate system. As we can see, the X axis and the Y axis, they're perpendicular to each other. They form a nice 90 degree angle, and that is going to be the key to making our lives easier. So let's say that they gave us a vector, vector F, and we have its magnitude, and we have an angle defined by this vector. Well, what we can actually do is we can take this vector and separate it into two components. The first one is going to be the component in the x direction, which I call fx, and the second one is going to be its component in the y direction, fy. Now notice, just like the previous method, the parallelogram method, we created a triangle. But in this particular case, it's very nice because we have a right triangle where we have a 90 degree angle. Therefore, if I'm looking for these two components, fx and fy, well, it's actually a very nice formula where f is simply going to be the magnitude of our vector multiplied by cosine theta, and fy is going to be f multiplied by sine theta. But keep in mind where this angle is. This angle is with the x-axis. If it's with the y-axis, you're going to have to flop, <laughs> flip or flop the cosine and the sine. So don't forget that. It's uh, something where a lot of students get used to using cosine for the x-axis, and if we give them the angle with the y-axis, just by default, they'll still use cosine. But just keep that in mind that this is for an angle that's measured with respect to the x-axis. Now, the reason why this is nice is because it limits where our components can be. Remember before when we had vectors, they could be any sort of direction. We would normally say that this vector is, let's say, 100 pounds or 100 newtons, and it's located 32 degrees with the x-axis. We don't have that problem anymore because if we look at the components, they're going to be one of two things, either perfectly horizontal or going to be perfectly vertical. So this really helps us limit the amount of possible directions we can have. Now, more specifically, if we're looking at the horizontal direction, this limits our vector directions to one of two cases. Our vector can either be going to the right or it can be going to the left. That's it for the x direction. Same with the y direction. Our vector can either be going up or it can be going down. So since we only need two things to define these components, what we do for simplicity is we simply add a positive or a negative sign to these vector components to indicate their direction. So for the vertical direction, remember, we can only go up or we can go down. So what we do is we say a vector that is going upwards is going to be positive, and a vector that is going downwards is going to be negative. That one's very intuitive. I'm sure you guys have dealt with that before. Similar, similarly, for the vertical, or not vertical, horizontal direction, uh, we define going right as positive and going left as negative. 
nice and easy. So for these components, we simply made complex vectors that rely upon angles into simple magnitudes that can be just positive or negative. And whether it's positive or negative, you will know which direction it's going. So remember at the very beginning, when I talked about Cartesian vector notation, notation, you guys are thinking, what does that mean? Well, in Cartesian vector notation, we actually define our vector in a very specific manner. And in this case, we actually define it according to its components. So if I have a vector f in Cartesian vector notation or CVN, I would define the vector as such, where it has the x component fx and what we say is the i direction plus the y component fy in the j direction. So this is going to be for 2D cases. We have an x component and we have a y component. And you're saying, Clayton, why are you hinting at 2D? Does this mean we're going to be doing 3D? Well, unfortunately, yes, that's the topic of next week, 3D vectors. But don't worry, Cartesian vector notation is very nice in that it allows us to extend to 3D very simply. Because if we look here, we have an X component and a Y component, so the two directions. And if we think about 3D space, all we're doing is adding that third direction. So for 3D, it would simply be FXI plus FY in the J direction, plus that third component FZ multiplied by K. So the key here to keep in mind is when we're talking about which directions, we actually use these i, j's, and k's. So in this particular case, we're using i, j, k to define the x, y, z directions. Now you may be saying, Clayton, why exactly are we doing this? Well, I think it's because we typically use the variable x as a variable. So I can't say, if I had it as a variable, I can't say we're going x in the x direction. It starts to get confusing. So for simplicity, we always use i, j, and k to define the x, y, and z directions respectively. So if you ever see an i, it means it's going in the horizontal or x direction. If you ever see a j, it's referring to the vertical direction. And when you guys see a k, it'll be that third 3D direction. Now, you guys may be saying, Clayton, this is still a little bit confusing. How about we go through an example? And I completely agree. So let's say that we have a vector f here, and we know its angle with the horizontal axis. So using the formulas before, we can split it into two components. We can say that the x component is, let's say, 4, and the y component is 3. If I wanted to write this in Cartesian vector notation, it would look like the following, where we have 4i plus 3j. Again, i is with the horizontal direction, j is with the vertical direction, and notice how both of these components are positive. If we look at the horizontal component, it is going to the right. Therefore, it's going to be positive. And if we look at the vertical component, Fy, it is also going, it's going upwards, sorry, so it's also going to be positive. Now, if I were to take this same vector, but switch its direction, so now it's going to the left and downwards, again, the components will always be positive. Those magnitudes are always going to be positive, but if I wanted to write this in Cartesian vector notation, it would look like the following, where I say negative 4i minus 3j. So again, both components are now negative because it's going to the left and it's going downwards. And I can flip this any way I want. So if we have the third case where it's now going left but upwards this time, I would write this vector as negative 4i, the negative because it's going to the left, plus 3j, positive because it is going upwards. So as you guys can see, this allows us to very quickly write vectors and it eliminates that need for always defining angles with the vectors. I just have my i, j, and k and I put the components out in front of them. So why is this so important, Clayton? Why do we write vectors like this? Well, it addresses the problem we had before when we're trying to add vectors. So if we have our vectors in this Cartesian vector notation, we can add them together very simply because all we have to do is just add the components. That's it, that's all, it's actually that simple. So let's say I had two vectors, f1 and f2, and of course they have an x component, so we see we have fx1 and we have fx2, and they have y components, fy1, fy2. If I wanted to add these together to get my resultant vector, instead of going through the parallelogram method making that crazy ass triangle, all I need to do is just add the components together. So if I look at the i component, or the horizontal component, it's simply going to be fx1 plus fx2. And if I look at the vertical component, it's simply going to be fy1 plus fy2. It's that easy, which makes our lives a lot easier. In the end, that's what we want. We want our lives to be easier. 
So let's go through an example just to show you guys just how easy this is. So if we had f1 as 3i plus 4j, so it would be going right by amount of 3 and then up by the amount 4. And we had f2 as negative 2i plus 8j, so this one's going to the left 2 units and then up 8 units. If I wanted to add them together, all I do is take the 2i components, throw them together. So I got 3 from f1 and then plus negative 2 from f2 and that's going to be for the i direction. And the j direction is going to be 4 from f1 plus 8 from f2. This will leave me with my final answer of 1i plus 12j. And that's all I have to do to add these two vectors together. I don't have to draw any triangles. I don't have to try and screw around with any trigonometry, which is great. We have our resultant vector. Now, more importantly, this allows us to add multiple vectors in a single step. If I had an f3 and f4, well, all I have to do is add those components into my addition. This allows me to kind of create this nice formula where if I'm adding vectors in 2D, I can add an infinite amount of vectors simply just by adding their components. Now again, Clayton, why is this so nice? Well, this is easy to program. I can very easily go into MATLAB, Python, C++, whatever you want, and very easily program this so that my software can add all my vectors together really, really fast. All right, so that's kind of the nice thing. Now, another thing that we can do is we can write our vectors in terms of a magnitude and direction, which is great because one of the things that we discussed in the very first video was that in essence, a vector is a quantity with a magnitude and a direction. So it's kind of nice to be able to express our vector as such. So what I can do is I can take my vector, which has an X component FX in the I direction and a Y component FY in the J direction, and I can write it as follows where it's going to be the magnitude of the vector multiplied by another vector. So the first part out front here, this is going to be the magnitude of the vector, and it's simply just going to be a scalar. So that's nice for us. The second part is where things get interesting. So this right here is the vector's direction. As we can see, it's a vector, and it's going to define the direction of the vector. Now this is going to be very important. This piece right here is actually called the unit vector, okay? And the unit vector. I'm going to let, say that a couple times just so it gets stuck in your head because this is something you guys are going to see in the next video, the video after that, and even a couple more after that. As you guys are going to see, this is going to play a very important role moving forward. This unit vector defines the direction of a vector. But we're going to put that on the back burner for now, and we're going to talk about the magnitude of a vector. So that's that first part out front. Now keep in mind that if we know the components of a vector, we're essentially creating a right triangle. If I were to say that I'm going three units in the horizontal direction, or the I direction, and two units in the vertical direction, well, the magnitude, which is going to be the hypotenuse of this triangle, can be very easily solved using simple trigonometry, where that magnitude, or the actual uh, vertical, no, a diagonal vector, is simply going to be its x component squared, plus its y component squared, and then square rooted. Now, what's nice about this formula is it serves as an important reminder to you guys that magnitudes are not negative. We've always talked about how these magnitudes are never negative, and it just goes to show if we look at this formula. You guys would have to be very creative to get a negative magnitude using this formula. First of all, we're squaring the components. So even if our components are negative, they're going to be squared to become positive. The second part is, is we have a square root. You can't square root a negative number, at least not in this class. You guys may be saying, oh, Clayton, you're thinking about complex numbers. Maybe, maybe you're just an idiot and you don't know about complex numbers. I know about complex numbers, but I'll give you guys a little secret here. If you guys are using complex numbers in structural engineering, uh, you did something wrong. I, I, I wouldn't want to go into your building. So that's going to be the magnitude. As we can see, it's nice and easy. If I have my vector in Cartesian vector notation, so I have its x and y components, I can very simply find the magnitude of that vector. But what about that other piece, that unit vector? So again, that vector that we multiply the magnitude into, that defines the direction of our vector, and it is called the unit vector. Now this unit vector has a lot of very specific properties that are going to be very important moving forward. All right, very important. You guys are going to hear about this unit vector an absolute ton. So let's discuss it, let's discuss it a little bit before we move into the, the crazier topics. First of all, how do we get this unit vector? Well, it's actually very simple. Unit vectors can be obtained by dividing each component of a vector, 
by the magnitude of the vector. So remember, we said if we have the components, we're good to go. And with the components, we can find the magnitude. So we have everything we actually need. So in essence, the unit vector can be found by taking the x component, dividing by the y component, or sorry, by the magnitude, and then the y component, and also dividing that by the magnitude. Now note here that in the end, we have two components. We still have something in the i direction and something in the j direction. The unit vector is going to be a vector. Another thing that I want to note here is that when we look at what we're dividing, we're basically taking, if we have a force vector, we're taking something with the units of newtons or pounds, and we're dividing it by something of unit with units, newtons, or pounds. So the units are actually going to cancel out. So one key piece of information for this unit vector is it's actually going to be unitless. Because again, if we have pounds on top, pounds on the bottom, they're going to cancel out. Now, if you guys put units at the end of a unit vector, I'm sure that the prof's going to be a bit of a dick, take off, a, take off some marks. So I just want to let you guys know that now. Now, some of you guys may be saying unit vector, unitless. That's why it's called a unit vector, right? Well, unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's a good way to remember that it's unitless, but the unit vector is actually called a, a unit vector because of one very specific property, which is the magnitude of a unit vector is always going to be equal to one. All right, so if I have a unit vector, no matter what it is, if I'm told it's a unit vector, its magnitude is going to be one. I don't have to do any sort of calculation. And this is going to make a lot of the formulas we use in the coming weeks a lot simpler because we can make that nice simplification. So let's do an example to show you guys how we obtain one of these unit vectors. So let's say I'm given a force vector and its components are negative 2i, so it's going two units in the left direction plus 8j, so 8 units in the vertical direction. If I want the magnitude, we said that's easy, we got a nice formula. So the magnitude is simply going to be negative 2 squared plus 8 squared added together and then square rooted. So the magnitude is going to be around 8.25. Now, since I have the components, negative 2 and 8, and now I have the magnitude, which is 8.25, I can find the unit vector by simply taking those components and dividing them by the magnitude. So if I'm looking at the horizontal components, or the i direction, I'm just going to take that negative 2 divided by the 8.25, and that's what gives me the negative 0 0.243. So that's for the horizontal direction. If I want the vertical direction, I'm going to take that 8j, so 8 in the y direction, divide that by 8.25, and that's what gives me the 0 0.970 in the j direction. So that's going to be my unit vector. Now, it's kind of hard to see what exactly this means. So let's write out our vector as, fol as follows, where we have the magnitude multiplied by the unit vector. So we can write this vector as 8.25, again, that's the magnitude, and we're multiplying that into this unit vector. Now, it still doesn't become really apparent what does this mean, so let's look at our actual example. If I were to show that unit vector on an xy grid, it's going to look something like this. Now, you trolls out there might say, Clayton, that's not exactly to scale. Well, I, I know it's not exactly to scale. It's just for purposes of illustration. So we have our unit vector here, and what we're doing with that unit vector is we're multiplying each component by a scalar. Now remember that when we multiply a vector by a scalar, as we discussed in the first video, is we're simply extending or scaling that vector, all right? So if we take that unit vector there and we multiply it by 8.25, we're simply stretching it by a magnitude 8.25, and that's what gives us our actual force vector. And that's it for this lecture video. Again, it's nice and easy, and the reason why is because we're still in two dimensions. And that's where the fun ends, because next week, so in videos, I guess, uh, four, five, and six, I guess, we are dealing with three-dimensional vectors. You guys may be saying 3D, Clayton, that sounds like garbage. Well, it is. It's, it's more garbage than 2D. 2D is really nice because it's very easy to picture what's happening. In 3D, it's a little bit harder, but it's in the end, it's not going to be too bad because we're going to take this Cartesian vector notation and we're simply just going to add a K component and everything is going to start working out really nicely. Now, again, disclaimer, I want to throw this at the end of every video. The best way to learn what we teach in the theory in this class is through examples. So in the description down below, I'm going to have an example of how to add multiple vectors using Cartesian vector notation and describe some of the tricks that I usually see on exams and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, those will be down in the description if you guys need it. 
And if you guys don't eat it, perfect. I will see you guys in the next set of videos, which will be discussing week number two, which is three-dimensional vectors. So thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day, and I hope these videos help somewhat. <laughs> all right, thanks, guys. I will see you guys in the next video.